The book is Building Mathematics for Learning Communities, Improving Outcomes in Urban High Schools. Um, so I always think it's a good idea to start with a little bit about oneself. So I'll start um, telling you a bit about myself. Some of you already know this, so I apologize for any repetition. Um, I'm a former public high school mathematics teacher myself, and my research focuses on those social and cultural factors that promote mathematics engagement, learning, and performance for underserved students of all ages. And as Roger mentioned, in my work, I'm seeking to reframe the discourse about black and Latino um, mathematics achievement in particular. So um, many of you have heard about um, you know, the achievement gap, which is a lot of attention in the press, um, not just the research press, but also the popular press. And so a lot of my work seeks to move us beyond documenting failure and to examining success. So I'm going to start by reading a little bit um, from the preface of the book, which I think will tell you a little bit about me and also how I came to study um, these issues in mathematics education. So this is from the preface. I have been a lover of mathematics since I was a child when my favorite neighbor, Kelly, would give me math problems from shiny new workbooks and tell me that I was great at math. I never heard from my parents that it was odd that I was good at mathematics. When I went to school, I learned math mostly from teachers who taught the subject traditionally, but with great enthusiasm. Looking back, I can appreciate the genius of my sixth grade math teacher, who gave us pop quizzes that didn't look like any we'd ever taken before. My ninth grade teacher told us that doing proofs in geometry was extremely difficult, but worth doing and doing well. And my 11th grade teacher made sure that my senior year schedule included advanced placement mathematics, calculus. Why wouldn't you take AP Capital, she asked me, when I told her that I needed only three years of high school math to graduate. Um, because I did well in school mathematics, friends and classmates sought me out for math help, as did family members and neighbors. Thus, it came as no surprise to many that I became a high school math teacher. As a teacher, I remembered all the math conversations and tutoring sessions my high school friends and classmates and I had had and I used those experiences as a foundation for a morning peer tutoring program for and by students who wanted to work on math. So while I received outstanding academic preparation, what I remember and value just as much as my time in school are my math experiences with my family, with teachers and community members, and with other young people. These experiences, along with my formal preparation, have been equally important to any claim I have to being a so-called math person and have influenced how I teach, think about, and do mathematics and mathematics education research. Consequently, when I walk through city neighborhoods or through the halls of urban schools, I do not see them as empty of promise, although there are plenty of stories about what these areas, their schools, and their students supposedly lack. I look for the talent that I know is there. My own experiences of growing up in a big city and attending urban public schools revealed to me that there were young people, parents, teachers, school administrators, and neighbors who were interested in math and who were interested and invested in my success. When I look at our cities, I expect to see the same communities committed to young people's school and math success. So this book is about my efforts to uncover these communities, which too often are hidden or ignored, and to encourage the teachers of young people, whether in or out of school, to not only look for, look at, and learn from communities that support math success, but to help cre create and sustain them as well. So there are three themes that are covered in this book, and um, three major themes, and they are that urban high school students are interested in mathematics, that schools and teachers can better facilitate students' mathematics learning, and that teachers and students can collaborate to build effective mathematics learning communities in schools. Um, so the urban high school students are interested in mathematics. There are lots of myths about students' interests in mathematics, and I'll take a moment to unpack some of those. That schools and teachers can better facilitate um, students' mathematical learning. Unfortunately, what I see, what I have seen in my research in schools, is that um, teachers and administrators um, mean well. They have good intentions, but sometimes they inadvertently put up obstacles to students' mathematics learning. And finally, teachers and students' collaboration are really important drivers for student success. And so the last part of the talk, I'll talk about a peer tutoring program that I designed at a local high school in New York um, 
that forms like the third part of the book. So starting with the, the myths and mythologies about um, particularly black and Latino students in math. Who can do mathematics? So we see lots of images in the popular press and also on television shows and media, um, and discussions of the achievement gap. All these conversations, um, as Teresa Perry points out, almost surely will reinforce the national ideology of black intellectual inferiority. And as such, the conversation is likely to be the location of yet one more narrative that further undermines how African-American students are seen by others, but also affect how they see themselves. So I don't know if you can see this um, ad well, so I'm gonna have to describe it for you. And I talk about this ad and other advertisements in the book as well, and getting at some of these myths about who can do mathematics, who's interested in mathematics. I saw this ad in um, a Sports Illustrated magazine it's an ad for Intel, so you know all those Intel ads that come out. And the um, notation is overachievers meet your processor. So these are the overachievers. So it looks like a high school yearbook. And I was looking at this with my nephew, who is now 15, and he said, huh, I guess I can't be an overachiever. And I said, why would you say that? Because you, you are an overachiever. He said, well, I don't see anyone who looks like me on this graphic at all. So the fact that this was an Intel ad, a national ad that was running in periodicals, but also the juxtaposition of that ad um, is Sports Illustrated, which I don't know if you've looked at Sports Illustrated recently. I have. Um, there's a lot of talk about athletic prowess and lots of um, graphics about you know who's physically gifted. And so the people who are physically gifted in Sports Illustrated are not the same people that are represented in this ad. So it's a very startling juxtaposition. So this discourse permeates not just what we see in schools, not, what we, not just what we see in classrooms, but also what we see in the popular press, and it affects how we think about excellence. It affects the discourse that we have about excellence. So when I go into schools and I say, who are your high achieving students in math? Um, depending on the type of school, I might get the response, oh, we don't have any of them which is something that I should never hear in any school. And so often I end up asking the students. And the young people can pretty accurately tell me who's good at math. And then when I go back to the, the teachers or the school administrators, they say, oh, right, I forgot about that person. Um, I wasn't thinking about that. They have made all A's. I just, you know. So this permeates our own thinking. Um, and I include myself in that. Um, so I hope everyone in the room knows who this is, but if not, this is a character from a very popular television show that was on, I don't know, gosh, 20 years ago now. So I want to read you a couple of things that relate to this picture. Um, just to remind us that the dominant depiction of math and media in popular culture in the United States is that of a discipline that only a select few people do. And there's a prevalent view that people who do well in mathematics do so naturally. Consequently, unlike other disciplines that we believe require hard work, good writing can be developed, for example. Our societal emphasis on mathematics as a difficult subject in which we expect few people to do well hampers our development of mathematically proficient people of all backgrounds. We accept underachievement in math as a natural state of affairs. This is particularly damning for students who are from underrepresented groups, as I mentioned. <coughs> but there are two, at least two, I'm sure maybe people could tell me about other representations that I'm not aware of, so please do tell me if there are. There are at least two alternate media representations that do present black or Latino youth as capable of mathematics. Um, Stand and Deliver, a movie based on the true story of Jaime Escalante, a mathematics teacher at East Los Angeles Garfield High. How many of you have seen this movie or know of Jaime Escalante's work, okay? And A Different World, a television show that portrayed the lives of predominantly black students attending a historically black college. Both of these representations simultaneously reify and shatter stereotypes about students of color and mathematics. So I'm gonna assume that um, we probably have all 
seen and heard a lot about Jaime Escalante. We've seen Santa's liver. I do just want, there's a lot in the book about this, but I do just want to point out a couple of things. Um, the magic of movies, right, made you believe that this um, Jaime Escalante program at Garfield High was sort of an overnight sensation, right? Um, but in the papers and books that Jaime Escalante himself wrote, he talked about how he de developed that program over a period of about six to eight years, and how it took a while, <clears throat> excuse me, to develop. And among the issues that he had to address was teachers' low expectations of students, and the idea that these students couldn't do math. These are Latino students in East LA. So I'm not gonna say much more about um, Stand and Deliver, because I wanna get to the good part, <laughs> a different world, because no one really talks about this. Um, so shockingly, and in contrast to Stand and Deliver, very little research has been done examining the possible cultural impact of the television show A Different World, which ran from 1987 to 1993, on adolescents' educational aspirations. A Different World is important because it was the first television show to regularly depict young black people in college classrooms. Um, developed and produced by Bill Cosby, who was well known for his interest in education, A Different World was a spin-off of the immensely popular Cosby show. Um, and I could focus on A Different World many positive images of black students and its portrayal of blacks of multiple and complex backgrounds and experiences. But I do want to focus on um, this character you see here, one mind-bending, subversive character, Dwayne Lane, an uber nerd from Philadelphia, who not only became cool and got the girl, but also was shown doing math, loving math, earning his PhD in math, and embarking on what appeared to be a research career in mathematics. What is brilliant about the characterization of Dwayne Wayne is that different world writers allowed him to shift and mature from a nerdy, socially clueless, yet caring misfit to an intellectual, attractive, and urbane adult who showed America what we had not seen on the small screen, a mathematically talented black American. When you look at television shows even now and the depictions of people who are good in mathematics, um, movies, um, Beautiful Mind, for example, Good Will Hunting, other recent films. You know, the people who do well in math um, seem a little crazy. <laughs> they have mental problems. So, Wayne Wayne is important not just because he's black and he does well in mathematics, but he's a very well developed, complex, and dare I say, non crazy character. You can see yourself saying there's nothing wrong with doing well in math based on this person. Um, <coughs> Dwayne Wayne was unique in that his personality and humanity were not at odds with his mathematical abilities. He did not have to literally or figuratively become a different person in order to excel. He remained true to himself. He was very much himself, still the same kid from Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Anderson and um, Ms. Lane also mentioned some other research that I'm doing where I'm interviewing African-American mathematicians about their formative experiences in mathematics. And I'm interviewing, or have been interviewing mathematicians of all ages. They range in age from um, about 90 to about 30. And I ask them all pretty much the same questions, and we, our interviews go in different directions depending on the respondent. So one of the questions that I ask um, most of the, all these mathematicians is what made you decide to become a mathematics major in college? And I got this response from one person. Did you watch a different world? Okay, anyway, I was like in love with Dwayne Wayne. I thought I was so cool. Oh, like, it's cool that he majored in math. I had this glorified image of going to an HBCU, an historically black college or university, and majoring in math. I thought I was cool like Dwayne Wayne. Part of me was just like, I guess it'll be all right, because I saw it, I saw it on TV, so it's not crazy. So sadly, characters like Dwayne Wayne, a young black man from an urban area, smart, interested in mathematics, in college, not a troublemaker or few and far between in media today. Instead, we see that young people who are black and Latino, particularly in cities, are constructing ways that um, reify destructive stereotypes and diminish their humanity. Unfortunately, in schools, this means that many educators have images of urban students that position them as uninterested in the school and with limited intellectual potential. So I share this example of Dwayne Wayne and the mathematicians' comments about him 
because it reminds us that narratives have power. And further, that positive narratives need to be shared, not just as counter narratives, but also so that they might be used to interrupt dominant narratives about achievement and who can is expected to achieve at high level. This is particularly true of the narrative about the mathematics achievement gap in the United States, especially as it pertains to urban schools and students. So in my work um, at Lowell High and some other places, I was very interested in what contributed to students' mathematics success. Again, a focus on potential and success rather than deficit and struggle. Um, and so in these projects, um, I did surveys and interviews with students. Um, this theme of academic communities repeatedly emerged. And um, it became clear that students were benefiting from lots of different people in their networks that supported their mathematics learning. So it wasn't just the teacher, but it was family members, but it wasn't just parents, it was aunts and uncles and cousins. Um, it was peers, um, friends and enemies, I'll say a little bit more about that, um, <laughs> neighbors, um, people on the street around the corner who supported students' um, mathematics engagement and learning. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a tool that I've used with students. Um, and actually, my, one of my research assistants at the time, Nathan Alexander, um, did this as well with elementary students. So um, most of my work has been with high school students, but Nathan's work showed that you could get a lot of really vital and interesting information about students' academic communities <coughs> from young people in fourth grade and fifth grade, which is very exciting. So this is a high school student who was participating in the study um, at Lowell High. And um, the prompt, and you can change the prompt to anything you want. Um, so the prompt is, I do well in math because of these people. And she started with her teacher, her mother, um, her aunt, because she's very good at math and she helps me with my hard math homework. My friends, because when I still don't understand the work, they help me figure it out. And I like this one especially because this person said, I need another circle. Um, you didn't give me enough room. And she has a fifth layer, my cousins, um, because they're very good at math. So this is a student who's drawing on all these resources to um, help her succeed. And we have similar, um, similar stories from students. So the bulk of the work that's reported in this book comes from um, my work at Lowell High School, which is a pseudonym. Um, I was at Lowell as a participant observer from 2003, so I have a long relationship with the school. I was initially invited by the principal to be there um, to critique the mathematics practices and pedagogy of teachers and ended up staying, much like, as Roger pointed out, I was at TT for a year and stayed. <laughs> I was at Lowell that year and ended up staying doing additional work. And there were some challenges that I saw at Lowell, but I also saw some opportunities. And one of the most interesting things that came about from this study was um, sort of the lack of knowledge that students had about each other's networks, and certainly the lack of knowledge that teachers had about students' positive networks. When you go into schools, any school in any vocation, you might hear, and I'm learning um, as an adult myself, this is kind of a generational thing, you tend to think that high school kids, um, I'm embarrassed to even say that I think this way, but I'm sure you can all agree, you tend to think that their peer groups probably aren't the best peer groups. <laughs> peer groups are to get you in trouble, um, you know, maybe to help you ditch school, pass notes in class, talk back, and other worse things, right? We don't tend to think of peer groups very positively. But in this work at Lowell, I saw the peer groups were generally very positive. And although a lot of the discourse around high achieving students, particularly in these urban environments that are predominantly black and Latino, um, is that, well, they're gonna be teased and disrespected because they're smart, that wasn't happening at all at this school. So the peer groups there were largely supportive, non-judgmental. I interviewed several students, but I'm gonna highlight one student, Linus, because I like Linus a lot. And found him very interesting. So Linus had a friend, Andrew, um, and he says, this is how people talk about us. Okay, we're the good ones in math. And people always ask us, how do we know it? How do we know it before the teacher teaches it? How do you do that? How do you understand if you can even teach it yet? And later in this interview, Linus pointed out that he and Andrew work together on math problems when they don't understand something. 
But Linus also added that he is pushed by family members outside of school. I'm the youngest of all the cousins, so they push me. People always push me. Like, a lot of this in math. My brother is like, come on, you've got to compete with me. You've got to be up there in math with me. But Linus' oldest sister, who was in college at the time, also had very high expectations of him. And Linus describes this as overrating me, which is a very interesting way of putting it. And so we asked him, well, what, what do you mean by that? He said, well, my sister, she overrates me. Like, if it's not 85 or higher, my grade on the test, or 90 or higher, she goes, why well, get an 85? You only know 85% of this stuff? But since she doesn't have a good math background, she wants to see me do good at math. She doesn't want me to mess up in math like she did. She used to have a lot of problems. She used to pass the class, but she would struggle. So if we imagine Linus's sort of map of influences, we see his cousins are on there, Andrew's on there, the big sister's on there. But these people are, are providing help and encouragement to Linus in somewhat surprising ways. So it's not that his sister's great at math and he can call her to help him with his math work. His sister is sort of serving as kind of a balance to, as explaining what you need to do in order to be good at math. Um, this is very helpful network information for kids to have. And the fact that children have these networks is really important for us to understand and value in school. So lastly, Linus has a friend who moved to Florida. It was his best friend. And he said, I still talk to him. And whenever we talk, he's like, you still the king of math? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm good at math, and he's good at math, too. And we went to junior high together, and we're still talking about math. So these are you know, extensive relationships that don't dissipate, that young people value and see as contributing to their um, mathematics achievement. So with all this richness of conversations I was having with young people at Lowell, the work I was doing with teachers, um, as a researcher, I had a great meeting with the principal, and this is what you want as a researcher. This is exactly what you want to happen, those of you who are doing research. The principal said to me, what would you like to do next? You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, when I was a high school teacher, I had this um, kind of peer tutoring program, and I think it'd be great to do that here because the kids have a lot of networks that you know, other kids don't know about, the teachers don't know about, and I think we could really sort of change the conversation about math in this school and sort of bring everybody on board to doing that. The principal said, great. Um, I should acknowledge that the department gave me a little bit of seed money to do the program, which was great, thank you for that. And um, we got underway. So I'm going to describe a little bit about this peer tutoring program. And this is the part of the book that talks about collaboration between school adults and young people. So um, we did tutor development. Um, there were some students who were identified by the principals and the teachers and other students. That was really important. And then for this part of the project, I wanted to involve um, graduate students here at Teachers College, uh, particularly pre-service teachers, because there's a lot of research that talks about how um, pre-service teachers um, need additional experiences um, in classrooms before even their student teaching, before they become teachers themselves, just to become, um, to, get to, know, to get to know the students, to get to know the curriculum, all those experiences. Um, and then we decided to do after school sessions three days a week and um, the students wanted to focus on homework and test preparation. So the way this is described, it sounds like this sort of came from on high down to the students, um, but it really did not. The students helped to identify the tutors. We had what I guess people would call a training session that I led that was really very collaborative and I have more information about that in the text of the book. And um, we had the TC students participate as sort of mentors, um, just in case students who were tutoring felt nervous about the material and needed some you know, re resource. Who was not the teacher? It was very important to us that the students felt that they had control over the session. And we got underway. And the program started off, as you might expect, as I would say lots of good things start out, um, very slowly. Very quietly, we'd have one or two students coming in per week. And then suddenly it took off. Um, the tutors were instrumental in that because they designed um, 
the recruitment strategies for 2T. So they would post flyers, they made up placards, posted them, handed them out like postcards in the hallways, and said, Aren't you, don't you want to pass the Regents? And uh, so kids started coming. And so the young people really began to run this program. Um, so this program had at least, I would say, two formal incarnations over a couple different years and um, several informal incarnations for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to take time to get into now. Um, but suffice it to say that in this particular school there were lots of principal changes. And so sometimes, some years it was difficult to get back into the school, other times um, it was very easy. So what I think is interesting about the incarnations of the program is that um, it was different each time. And this is a very small school, uh, some of the same students, but there were um, some similarities and differences across incarnations. So the first year there were mainly female tutors, and then the next time we did it, um, there were mainly male tutors. And even when the program, and there was a principal shift, um, the program ended one year, I ran into one of the assistant principals on the street, and she told me the kids are still trying to do your peer tutoring program. They're doing it themselves, which is exactly what you want to hear. They have really taken um, ownership of the program. Um, so there's quite a bit I could say about the findings in terms of students, you know, test scores and learning, and also what the TC students learned from the program, which was sort of an unexpected benefit. Um, that the mentors learned a lot about teaching from the young people when watching their interactions. But I'm going to focus a little bit on um, students' mathematics practice. So those of us who are um, doing lots of teacher education research, we should probably feel very comforted by this. Um, because you know, there's a lot of research that says you teach the way that you're taught. And even for high school students, this is true. So they tutored the way they were being taught in the classroom. So the very sort of, you do this, this is how you do it, write this down, fill in the formula, put parentheses around your numbers, that's how it started. But as the program continued over the span of the school year, um, students began to develop their own strategies to explain difficult concepts to, to their classmates. So they would use very vivid and rich analogies. They would use examples from movies or television shows or something that happened on the street earlier that day. Representations, they told stories. And I would see, um, while I was observing this program, the um, Teachers College students taking notes. I've got to use that when I teach this kind of tomorrow. Um, and you might be wondering about how the teachers in the school <coughs> responded to, to this program. Um, at first, the teachers in the school thought, well, I don't know if we're going to have any successful tutors because you know, we're a low-performing school in math. I said, well, we'll just wait and see. Let's just watch and see how they develop. So by the middle of the year, they said, oh, we're doing better. Yeah, I used that example in class. And when we started observing class, math classes in the school, we realized that there was a very slight shift, but a shift in um, how the mathematics class was functioning. So before it had been the teacher up front lecturing, as I am unfortunately doing with you now, and the young people taking notes, and that was it. You started to hear teachers say things like, well, you know, Janet had a really interesting way of explaining this yesterday in peer tutoring. Um, Janet, would you mind sharing, us, showing with us, sharing, sharing with us how you, how you did that? So Janet would come up to the board and do it. And so it became this, it became much more, a much more collaborative environment where the students um, had agency over their own learning and took ownership of the mathematics they were learning. And finally, one of the findings related to mathematics practice that I was really most excited about, because in this country there is so much of a, in a way, an expectation that you know, you're not really supposed to do well in math. So when I see people shift from that, it's very exciting. So we would see two toward students, the two T's, um, feeling very confident and explaining concepts, recognizing that they understood the concepts and that they could be tutors. Even if it was just on that one little concept for that day, they weren't always um, 
consigned to be the struggling math student. So the fact that they had some expertise that they could share um, was really valuable to them. Um, so those are some selected findings from the peer tutoring program. This is actually a picture, and I like this picture of the program because you can, it connotes movement, and you can see people working. There are teachers in this picture. Um, it was a very non-hierarchical space, eventually. Um, the teachers were told, you, know, you can't get up to the board and lecture all the time. You have to you know, talk <laughs> with the students and listen to the, the tutoring dyads. And the students really valued it. So this is a quotation from one of the tutors who said, figuring out for myself, which I think is really important, how to better explain it to other people helps me understand it better too. Um, I just think this is like super helpful. I like it a lot. I guess I feel like the more they can do it, the more they should do it. So um, this was in reference to um, the second incarnation of the program, in which the tutoring was only happening one day a week, and the kids said, we want it every day. And so the teachers had to think about, there always had to be a teacher supervising. Well, what is that going to mean? How are we going to do that? But they were able to do it because that's what the kids wanted, and I thought that was a very powerful statement. Um, so I guess in closing, I can take some time for questions and read a little bit more. I want to show you a few pictures, I think, of, um, I've spent a lot of time today talking about the peer tutoring program, which was happening in schools, and I, in school, and I sort of got away from the outside community, and how I think that it's really important that um, just as we have an emphasis on reading, you know, parents read to their aunts, uncles, grandparents, read to their little people every night. Um, I think we could do a lot more mathematics with young people. Um, I see people um, reading with their children on the, on the subway, for example. But I've also seen people doing math problems with their young people on the subway, which I think is very powerful. And so this is, um, I can't take credit for this photo. Um, one of my friends who always knows I'm always looking for um, quote, mathy thing, <laughs> took this picture and emailed to me, you've got to run up here right now to Lennox Avenue and 123rd Street, or 130th Street, and see this man doing this. And I couldn't, I was out of town. But what it says here is subtraction action. So this gentleman apparently um, puts not just math problems, so the theme for this day was subtraction, but also um, he does literacy exercises too. So he has opposite subtract, I guess where kids put in um, antonyms for things. And um, I just think it's a great sort of streetscape. And it's the kind of thing that we want to have more of. And it can generate a lot of discussion and kids are very excited about this. So I have not tracked him down yet. So if you <laughs> see him, you can tell him I'm looking for him. <laughs> and I think I'll close there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Miss, where, where, where is Lowell High again? Uh, Lowell High is a pseudonym for a school in the New York area. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you a little bit more about it if you would like to. No, no, I just, I, it, you were, it was coming up and I thought I, I missed where it was located when you first started. Yeah, I may, I may not have said. I apologize. Right. Yes? So, when you, the tutors, right, these are, these are students, upperclassmen who are working with lower classmen or, or within the group, it could be anybody. It could be anybody. Okay. Very, yeah. These students have a uh, self-identifying or staff is saying these are the students who recommend to be the tutors. How are they identified? It's both. And let me okay. explain why. Um, a lot of times when we ask teachers to identify um, students, um, they will pick a very particular kind of student. Um, when we ask kids to identify people who are getting mad, the kids would often choose those same types of students as the teachers, but they will also pick, um, I would say, more interesting people. So it might be people who um, maybe are B students instead of A students, um, but who are really good at explaining things. And I have some examples here where these are students who, you know, the, the school mathematics curriculum in this country 
um, traditionally has been a very sort of narrow, you know, you do well in it if you follow these sort of prescribed rules. And, you know, mathematicians are very creative thinkers. So there are many mathematicians who may not have been great in school mathematics. So I think that some of these kids are really highly creative mathematical thinkers, and they're not, they're just, not, it's not showing up as well as it could on sort of standard math assessment. So in asking the kids, um, you get a, I think, fuller picture of who is good in math and who's talented in math. The other benefit from a sociological and psychological standpoint is, um, I'll just speak very frankly, having been a nerd myself, <laughs> but also simultaneously, in a weird way, a cool kid, you want a cool sort of nerd mix, because you don't want it to just be the nerd hangout. Although you do want it to be, you want it to be okay to be a nerd, right? But in having this mixture of kids, it sort of um, validates everyone. So it validates the cool kids, it makes the nerdy kids a little more cool. The cool kids see it's good to be smart. It's, it's, it has a really nice impact on um, thinking about the culture of learning in the school. And I'm just, well, I'm going to ask that because I'm, I'm still not clear on how they got trained, right? I mean, uh -huh. if the teachers are ready to begin with right. are not using this model, right. if they don't, haven't thought of this way, and you're coming in, and maybe the students are coming from right. Columbia, but I'm, I'm not clear on how these students are then trained the to tutor. the tutors to help. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think, I hope it's in here, yes. In the appendix, um, I think it's appendix D or C, um, there are some trained materials, and these are materials that um, I developed for the students. Um, and, but there were also lots of parts where the students would um, contribute. So I would go over things like, um, you know, what is problem solving in mathematics? Because I wanted them to be flexible enough when they're tutoring, just like we want teachers to be flexible, right? If someone comes up with the wrong answer and doesn't understand it, you've got to have multiple ways of explaining the concept. So we talked about that. We went over some very specific types of content with them that would, would tend to come up. I asked them what kinds of things do you and your friends have problems with mathematically, and we'd go over that. And then there was a section where we talked about what made an effective teacher an effective tutor. And I have to tell you, um, which, which is, I'm sure is no surprise to you, that kids can tell you pretty much right in line with what the research says, what makes an effective teacher or a tutor. Um, so they knew what not to do. And um, we would talk about how important it was not to make people feel stupid when you're tutoring them, how, how many different ways are there to say, that's not quite right, you know. Um, so there was a training, we did an initial training session and then we would follow up with them um, as problems arose. But I have to tell you, honestly, after the initial training session, a lot of these kids were, were pros. They kind of took it and ran with it, which was very exciting. I gotta get this side of the room next, and then but you, you go first, Ken. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Good job. Um, use that model with concentric circles about you at the center, and then the teacher, and then the parent, and then the cousins, and the aunts, and uncles, and all that. There it is. Okay. So, um, what happens if a kid doesn't have those kind of supportive cousins and friends, and you know, how important um, is the family and the community in terms of your own research on the success of kids in math? Right, that's a great question. And um, for some of these, we would have, um, we never had a completely blank sheet. And that might have been because the kids are like, you gave me something to write on, I'm gonna write something. Um, but we did have several kids um, who had maybe just one or two <coughs> circles. And what they would put in those circles are um, either current or former teachers. Former teachers came up a lot. So for those of us who are teachers, you know, young people don't forget you. They don't forget you if you're great. They don't forget you if you're terrible. They don't forget you if you're somewhere in the middle. They remember and they glom on to something that you said. So there was one kid who actually just had two things and he was being interviewed by one of um, our research assistants and um, she asked, you know, are there other people? He said, no, that's really it. But, you know, the good thing is this teacher, the school is near my house, so sometimes I just drop in and say hi, and he remembers me, and sometimes he helps me with my math work. So even if kids don't necessarily have family structures, there's usually someone um, around to help them. 
Let me get this flag. That's like a, a good teacher. You want to call her name? That's right. Very exciting book. Wonderful presentation. Um, two chunky questions. I'd be delighted if you answered both. I'd be very happy if you answered one. Uh, the first is about uh, how do we flip the script or change this frame, this sort of deficit-based frame that so many, I mean, maybe perhaps even some of your <laughs> colleagues, but a lot of do-gooders will use a negative frame in terms of, you know, our kids don't have this or they're not good at this. Um, and people use that either to secure grant funding, to, uh, you know, promote the organization or their approach or their research lens. Um, so much of our society, you know, within, and especially within education, is uh, based on this deficit-based uh, approach to meeting the needs in, in our schools and outside of our schools. So what do you think it'll take to shift that, um, not only to shift our thinking, but to shift resources in the direction of acknowledging and replicating um, strengths within our communities? So that's one question. The second question is about, um, I, I read your book a few months ago, so um, forgive me if I'm forgetting, but, uh, have you, did you see a Lowell, um, Lowell, or have you seen or heard of folks who are using math to help, especially young people, um, become leaders in solving community problems? So whether it's analyzing needs or analyzing strengths within the community, and then using math to help other community members solve those problems. Right. Um, I'll, take, I'll take the second question first, I okay. think. So not in this particular project, but in other projects in New York City and around the country, um, there are, are programs that look at um, you know, math for social justice or a culturally re relevant pedagogy as it relates to mathematics. And um, some of the work that um, Gloria Lass and Billings has written about, and also William Tate, who is um, at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis, um, they've talked about how um, math teachers, primarily they tend to focus on middle school. Jacqueline Leonard at, um, was at Temple and found somewhere else. Also, does this kind of work. It tends to be more middle school work where the kids identify community problems or school problems and sort of mathematize them. And so they use math to solve, solve these problems. So William Tate has an example about um, a problem that some kids posed about, you know, why there's so many liquor stores in our communities and not more bookstores. So they did a study about showing the, the density of the population of the neighborhood and how what the ratio of liquor stores was to the population and also the ratio of libraries and took that to like a community board meeting. So that's an example of that. Um, in terms of your first question, it is hard. It is an, it is an uphill battle. Um, I think there's been a shift, and I'm sure not just in mathematics education, I'm sure my colleagues in science and um, English ed can say more about, about this as it relates to their disciplines. Um, but I think the point is, you know, we've spent decades sort of documenting this higher racialized, hierarchical achievement gap, which really tells us very little. Um, it tells us a lot about opportunity and equity. It doesn't really tell us anything about potential students' learning outcomes, really. Because if, if the playing field were equal, we would see different outcomes. So that's just um, a philosophy I have. So I think that, um, my hope is that by doing work like this, shedding light on excellence, um, bringing to the fore these um, very important stories and narratives um, that it can contribute to um, the shift in dollars that we're seeing. It's happening. I mean, I can just, this would actually be a great dissertation project for someone. Um, <laughs> I've seen a little bit of it when I look at, for example, the New York Times. Every time. There's a new National Assessment of Educational Progress report. So it used to be they talked all about, oh, this is the gap. Then they started sort of trying to explain with some reasons for um, the achievement gap. Um, now they've got into the opportunity factor. For a while, they were really hung up on um, acting white. They kind of so it, it is shifting. I think that'd be an interesting dissertation for someone to be looking at the shift in discourse and discussions of achievement gap. I'll post that somewhere. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, in chapter three, you um, mentioned the national, state, and school district policies and practices. Um, I haven't gotten that far. So is it really about sort of the, the implications it has?
for being able to have these sort of communities? Or can you talk about it more? Yeah. Part one. Uh, part two is how would you? I'll take it back. Did you ever think, from your experience with Lowell High School, that there might be an opportunity to spread this kind of practice across the district? Did the principals or teachers or students ever kind of allude to that opportunity? Yes. I'll take the second question first. Um, I feel like. It's one of these things where I wish I had the time and resources and the ideas early on to um, follow you know, these young people. So what would happen is you know, freshmen who were involved in the program, I might run into them on the street as 12th graders, and they'd say, oh, you know, I'm still you know, using those strategies, so they'd tell me things like that. The original principal of the school that I worked with um, moved to another state and apparently is um, instituting this criteria model in some of the schools there. And we had a nice email discussion about it and I sent them some of the training materials and all that. So I feel like it's living on and I may not know how um, exactly. I kind of know how it's living on in Lowell, but not how it's, it's, it's spread, if it has spread. I think a lot of people may use um, like peer tutoring dyads, but not quite in this way where the kids really have control over it. So I think that's, um, I think it's a very powerful thing and it makes it a little more sustainable if the kids sort of take ownership of it. Your first question about um, these, this policy and practice question, this is a really important um, component of the problems we face in mathematics education and education in general, I think. And I didn't spend a lot of time talking about them today. But in the book, I talk about not just how, you know, what happens within the school matter, but also things that happen at a national level, a state level, a school level matter. So one of the examples I give is Massachusetts and how, um, you know, within the same district even, um, there was a lot of discussion about who was capitalist for and who should have access to capital. And rationales vary widely. Districts decide to do different things based on an administrator's sometimes you know, gut feeling. I don't think kids are ready for capitalism, so no capitalism. Or we're not gonna do um, tracking and algebra, or we are gonna do tracking and algebra. So this is a study by Elizabeth Hussein. It's about 20 years old, but it's a very illuminating study because it shows you how policies get made it's very messy, and they have very dire consequences for young people, and you know, parents, teachers in the school even, young people, um, may not be aware that the decision about where they're gonna end up has already been made by someone who's not even in that community. Yes? So um, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to talk a little bit about some of what you may have seen in terms of how learning communities help to stoke the interest of kids in mathematics. Um, you know, I think so often uh, kind of motivation to pursue mathematics is kind of lays, you know, dormant in the spirit of kids. I mean, do you see evidence of these peer groups, these learning communities, bringing that to the fore? Um, I will say that the, in, in, in Lowell, I think, I think it could be different if the peer communities, the peer tutoring communities had a different kind of focus. Um, because Lowell was the type of school that it was, they were heavily focused on the region and getting kids to do their homework. So it was a very narrow focus. Um, I would have liked to have done a lot more with um, enriching mathematics. Um, so I don't think that happened so much in the peer tutoring. I think it could quite easily, but it just sort of didn't happen there. Um, but there is something where there's a section of this book when young people talk about, um, which I guess is what you're calling my attention to, um, what kinds of engaging, what kinds of mathematics experiences they find engaging. And um, what they find not engaging is pretty damning because it sounds like lots of math classrooms we've been in. Um, and you know, the kids are really funny and they talk about how what happens is a teacher writes something on the board, explains it once, and if you don't understand it, then that's it. And so when we tried to probe that, well, what do you mean? This is what happens. And the kid got up, modeled it, that's it. If you don't get it, it's over. And you know, I see that happen a lot in schools. Um, 
even the mathematicians who have interviewed say things like school math wasn't really that interesting, everything was just plug and chug. They say that. These are people who are very attuned and are very engaged um, with mathematics. So there are times when kids would say things about experiences they had that were engaging, um, and many times those were outside of school. So people playing math games with them, um, doing puzzles with them. There was one particular teacher um, at Lowell one year who was really big into giving puzzles when kids had finished their work. So kids really liked that. And the kids felt that he gave those puzzles, um, in the words of one kid, it's to exercise your mind. It makes me think fast or whatever, because he thinks I'm smart. That was really important to the young people. Um, but sadly, it doesn't happen enough in school settings. It often happens outside of school. So I'm not sure where we are on time. If I can keep on take over the leadership there, but do you have any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned in the, the initial program that the graduate students, typically pre-service students, uh, were involved as mentors. Uh, having gone through that, were the, uh, and I'm assuming that afterwards they were no longer involved in the uh, subsequent years? Yeah, they were. How vital do you, you know, obviously the graduate students benefited <coughs> from that. Uh, from a program perspective, uh, other than giving that uh, security to the tutors initially, do you feel that they were uh, played an important role in the program? And the reason I ask is this program was to be replicated in another part of the city. Um, how vital is getting that uh, post-secondary uh, participant or part? Um, I want to tell you something very honestly, which is that um, originally I thought it would be a good idea, it would be a good experience for the TC students to develop relationships with young people who weren't you know, their own students, they weren't responsible for the class. But in all honesty, I originally had the TC mentors there as kind of a buffer between the Lowell High School students and their teachers. Their teachers were such spoon feeders at that point. The teachers didn't think, they really loved the kids and were very dedicated teachers, but thought, well, if I'm not up there explaining it, they're not gonna be able to do it at all. And we had to have a Lowell teacher sort of in the room, it's a New York City, um, New York requirement. So um, originally I said to the, to the Lowell teachers, okay, so I've got these graduate students here, so you let them help out if there's help needed. And so that was kind of a, a cover for, and a nice way of me saying, look, don't get in the way. But um, what ended up happening was the teachers at first, the Lowell teachers weren't, um, one of them was pretty interested, but they weren't really all that interested until they started seeing things happening in class, and they would hear the kids say, Oh yeah, and program yesterday we did, and they said, oh, what's going on? So they would come and observe, and at that point, it was already sort of up and running, and they, they kind of stayed out of the way. Um, I think when we did the program the second year, um, there was already a culture around the teacher not getting in the way that um, it kind of worked out. We, we didn't have TC students helping out, but the kids were pros by then, and the teachers, um, I think, and I don't really know quite why, something I still think about, had figured out, at least in the after school part, the balance, the, the good balance between aiding when necessary but not taking over. They didn't do that during the school day, but they had figured it out for the after school.